Snowgoer Live, brought to you by Snowgoer Magazine and Snowgoer.com. From sled reviews to breaking news, riding destinations to gear evaluations, Snowgoer is snowmobiling. Now, here's our host, Snowgoer Editor, John Prusak. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Snowgoer Live. We have a special guest I'm going to introduce you to here. Um, if you've been to the snowcross races in the last, I don't know, 23, 24 years, you probably know the machines of our guest. The black Amsoil sleds have been a absolute staple of the tracks, and they're always at the front, and they're always very high profile, no matter which racer is on them. The guy behind that effort is Steve Shearing. But beyond being a team owner, he's also a builder, he's a promoter, he's a sponsor. When you own a snowcross team, you wear many hats. And he also has a pretty interesting history in our sport. So we're going to bring him in here and have a conversation about snowmobiling and racing and everything else. So you should now see Mr. Steve Shearing on my left. How are you this fine day, Mr. Shearing? Well, I'm fantastic. I appreciate you having me. Kind of looks like an interesting background you have there. Kind of a, a fantasy camp for uh, for motorheads like us. Boy, this is one huge toy box in here. We've got about six RS skidoos. We've got a couple of Can-Ams. We've got a UTV and ATV. Uh, it's a little paradise here. Now, um, again, to to maybe some of our younger viewers, they may know you as, as again, the guy behind the uh, Sharing Speed Sport team. But your history dates back a lot further to when, when, when you were the owner of a snowcross team, not that that's a just. Um, I believe you started racing in the late 70s, correct? You're like a history book, John. Well, started, yeah. uh, 1978, as soon as I got out of uh, Votech, I went to school for heavy equipment. I always wanted to race and never could really, you know, get it on help from my parents or whatever. So as soon as I got my first job, first thing I did was, I borrowed money and bought a race snowmobile. I didn't have a house. I didn't have a car. Yeah, you know, that stuff. But I wanted to go racing. And, Priorities. Um, exactly. 1987. And I started off with a, um, a Yamaha SRX 440. And we had a Skidoo 245 RV. And about 1992 uh, or, no, excuse me, 1986, I bought my first twin tracker. And we spent about... 10 years racing them and that was the time of my life it was uh, the heydays of oval racing and you know i still have some history with that and it was fun turned and then i turned about 34 and it seems like as you age your brain becomes a proportionate size with your body and something else shrinks so <laughs> you know the fun was going out of it and i was self-funding so i was pretty much broke all the time and sometimes bruised every day too so i kind of transitioned from racing to working on a crew and at that point you quit racing and then pretty much positive every racer will say this you think the world was going to end um right it was the opposite for me i had the time of my life i went to work for yamaha i worked for fast i was tony heikinen's mechanic i was chris vince's mechanic you know so i had some high profile drivers that we worked with and about that time the sport was starting snowcross was starting to explode and i was like oh this sport needs some independent teams out there like motocross and i'm like I'll give it a try. And we were fortunate enough to secure Amsoil the first year. And that was 1997, 98. Uh, we went out, we won the ESPN Winter X Games. We took second and third in the pro championships, which back then were 440s and 800s. And uh, just had great success. Uh, we moved forward and we bought the first, we were the first team to have this huge race transporter come on to the scene and yeah. shirts. You know, just a truly professional looking team that really wanted to bring it to the next level and and show the level of professionalism and then you know also incur additional sponsorship so at a first year that was just fantastic uh, the following year we were fortunate enough to bring on the air force we brought them on at a local level and we showed them you know what the sport's all about the excitement the adrenaline the you know the same kind of demographics that they're looking for and they fell in love with it you know, we gave them some good branding and the corporate airport people came up from San Antonio and they're like, this is the coolest deal. And fast forward 22 years, we've had a, an Amsoil partnership for 23 or 24 years, Air Force for 22. And it, it's just been, you know, a dream to be able to make my living off something I truly love. And you know what? Dreams come with a lot of damn work. I pretty much work 12 hours every day on this. Um, very fortunate my wife understands you know that they really love doing this and uh man you you can't sit still 
But let's actually get into the mechanical part of it, Steve. We'll, we'll, we'll touch on the, on the sponsorship part of it here in a little bit. But people see the sleds on, at the track on Friday or Saturday going around there, and they might think this is a weekend sport for some of you guys. This isn't. This is a year-long commitment. Talk about what goes into, first of all, year-round running a race team, but then, you know, week to week, breaking down those sleds, getting them ready each week so they're perfect when they hit the track. Well, like you said, it's a year-round event, and it's just like the Air Force when they're not at war, they're getting ready for war, and that's basically what we do the seven months out of the year that we're not racing. As I mentioned earlier, you know, normally this time of the year we'd be doing some early spring testing at the ski hill by us, trying to do some final touches on the skidoo race sled for next year and, and make those improvements into production with some validation. You know, fast forward, we'll, during the course of the summer, we'll be designing clothing, um, the race transporter behind me, you know, we'll have to have some repairs. Um, and we work on that. It's not just having the race sled go into the racetrack. It's, you know, your support vehicles, your race transporter, the logistics for your crew, where everybody's staying, where everybody's eating. That is such a bigger part of the equation that, you know, my hands of actually working on a snowmobile anymore are really limited. I still do the data acquisition and, and involved with the testing, but Steve Thorson and Elia Burns, they pretty much build 98% of the snowmobile, you know, yeah. and that's their job and they're fantastic at it. Me, you know, I'm kind of the ringleader. I got to make sure Hunter and Lincoln got the right clothing. I have to make sure our entry fees are paid. I have to make sure, you know, we have the woody studs and carbides in time to put them on. So it's, it's like staying on top of the whole game. And fortunately, each year I get a little smarter about that and understand, you know, the rhythm that needs to take place to have all these things in place so that we don't have holes in the map. And it, it, it never stops. And in addition to that, you know, we're doing the side-by-side and am racing in the summer. So we just got That's done cool. building a new car for that and a backup car. So we're hoping that some of these restrictions get lifted fairly soon because our first race is June 25th in Crandon. So kind of got our fingers crossed on that one. And what a cool way to make a living. Yeah. You know, one thing that, that, you know, you, I've been around kind of around the edges of, of racing for so long, getting back to the snow week days. Um, but even talking to some, some team owners earlier this year, just as far as, you know, when the trucks come in and park and getting your truck, you know, washed before you go in and park in the pits. So when people come and see you guys before and after the races, it's a, it's a good presentation and stuff. Um, there's a lot that goes into this that, that Joe Fan probably never realizes, but it's all part of the show, isn't it? And I'll give you a perfect example. Let's say we're going to be racing in the weekend. We'll leave probably Monday afternoon or Tuesday morning. We'll get out there Wednesday, and we don't get to normally park like the rest of the teams do. We'll go tie in with the U.S. Air Force, and we'll go do some school visits with the local high schools or secondary schools. We'll showcase our team, Hunter and Lincoln, myself, one of the mechanics will come. And we'll bring the race transport. We'll talk about technology and making good choices. The Air Force will do a soft sell there and, and really create some excitement for the race weekend. So that's pretty much all day Thursday. Thursday morning, I call Brian Russ, the guy that's parking, and say, as usual, I'm going to be late, so hopefully you can save my spot. And he's re they're really, you know, accommodating about that because they know that we're just out trying to promote the sport and raise awareness of, of the race weekend. So we do that. We... Um, we get to the track usually late, so I usually have to call the truck watch guy and say, hey, can you hang around for another hour? We're on our way. And I, you know, I lie a little bit. We're probably two hours out. But sure. they're pretty good about that, you know, and then they also have to throw in a hat or something at the end to kind of give them a little bit of icing. And then we finally park at maybe five o'clock on Thursday night rather than 10 o'clock in the morning like everybody else. Is. But you know what? We're really expanding the, the volume of people that are going to come to the races and, and bring awareness to our team and, and the sport and the opportunities in the U.S. Air Force and other products our sponsors have. So Absolutely. It's, it's really an enriching, you know, experience. So then we will race Friday and Saturday, usually um, at the majority of our races are Friday night and Saturday night. And what's interesting is we'll finish racing probably 10, 30, 11 o'clock on Friday night. And our next race is until probably two o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday. But by seven o'clock, everybody's up eating for breakfast because we're all excited and, yeah. you know, we want to prepare everything for the following day. And, you know, by the end of Saturday night, you're fatigued. You know, it's a lot of walking it like Spear Mountain. You're back and forth on that hill a hundred times a weekend and, you know, your legs feel like they're going to just burst. 
but it's like it's all part of the excitement and part of the passion and then you know depending on which race you're at let's say new york for example we'll leave sunday morning and then it's about a it's only like 20 hours back so myself and tony are driving we'll usually drive straight through the night we get back monday morning at that time we're unloading snowmobiles and washing them up kind of getting things cleaned up and doing a little post-mortem what happened on the weekend what did we need to improve on what did we do good that's so we're ordering parts on monday uh, starting to tear them apart the drivers are kind of refreshing themselves from racing all weekend so they will go and practice until tuesday so we kind of make a game plan for the following week and depending if there's a race the next weekend or if it's weekend off we'll actually go out on tuesday morning doze up the test track and then lincoln usually goes out and runs the groomer and make our own track and we'll start the whole process again we usually do tuesday and wednesday if we're not traveling a long ways or, um, or tuesday and leave wednesday afternoon and get a couple days of riding we're always trying to test something we're always trying to go faster because sure. the problem with the, the race rules now everybody's a problem or maybe it's a good thing but everybody's so close you yeah. know so if you can gain two feet I mean, that's a huge victory when we first started racing we had whole shot whole shot length leads of six sleds into the first corner because we had experience you know clutching and, and motors where everybody else just understood the shocks on the snow cross side so that's all evaporated you know now right. it's like man you got to be good on the trigger and you got to hang on just a little bit longer and everything has to be working perfect because you know not only do our guys have a chance to win in every every other race there's eight or nine other guys in the pro class that can win every weekend too so it's tough right now yeah it is you know let's uh let, let's jump next actually to to something you just brought up and then we'll go to sponsors um your test track you'd mentioned uh uh you know getting the test track ready and getting out and testing that's something that that the sharing speed sport team has that really no other team has uh currently you guys have a big test facility that you even let your competition come out there and run laps on you know when when early in the fall and getting that thing uh, ready before the season and stuff talk about what's involved with that so we started the climb compound uh 2005 and one of the reasons we wanted to create our own test track well actually there was two reasons one was we went up to um 12 hours north of Winnipeg, Manitoba, to Thompson, Manitoba, which is the polar bear capital of the world. Yes. And I'm like, there ain't no way in hell I'm coming back up here. <laughs> so I had worked at a ski and I had some you know, knowledge of making snow. So we started off with one snow gun, worked our way up to a dozen of them and a couple of groomers. And then part two of it was I saw a lot of young kids going to Spear Mountain, never been on a sled that year. And yeah. they, they didn't have fun. They got hurt. And I'm thinking, we're not going to have a sport in 10 years if these guys don't get someplace to go out. So we opened up our track to everybody at, at, at every level, including the pros. And the three weeks prior to Duluth, this is a hotbed of racing in the world, basically, in a small town of 1,300 people. And, <laughs> you know, it's like we, we always give good conditions. We always treat everybody fair. We treat everybody equal. And uh, this year got a little crazy because all of a sudden about 20 snow bikes showed up a week before Spear Mountain. And it was like a massacre out there but everybody got their time in everybody got good results and everybody appreciates what we do you know and it's all part of you know self-serving to keep the sport going because just like everything everybody wants your dollar now and so we're very fortunate and then after spear mountain the traffic you know goes down to a dozen people at most on a day so we can do a lot more of our own private testing shock testing right. um, just endurance runs with our drivers so it's pretty cool and you know we're usually making snow up here the second week of october and i don't know if that's something proud of or ashamed of but we have cold weather up here and right now it's april 21st we could still be out there riding had we not that shelter in place order right the um the the you're you're absolutely right i mean being a guy who used to be in a lot of the infields with the camera on my neck duluth you always had to have kind of happy feet especially when the sport classes were out there and things because there were a lot of kids that were airing it out that had had no practice and it was carnage fest but yeah the, it seems like everyone's showing up into the season more prepared now and it's places like what you have that make that possible so one thing you also mentioned earlier you you know you started out with amazoil the air force was in the in the door the second year you've had other long-term sponsors whether it's clothing sponsors energy drinks uh, uh tools and equipment um i don't think anybody 
works with their sponsors as much as you do in terms of getting them exposure at different events as far as getting that that truck you know whether you're to you know you, you go to the NHRA Nationals some years and there's the you know Steve's big truck in the background at, uh, at Brandon Minnesota um, how important is it for somebody who may want to race or someday own a race team to do that extra effort to to serve those sponsors and make them a part of the whole program well the days of going to a race putting a sticker on a snowmobile and counting on your results are long gone for yeah. sure that's important you know everybody wants to see a winner you know Amsoil and the Air Force and Ford and Milwaukee yeah, BRP all of our products love when we win but they want us in the social media spotlight you know we go to air shows during the summertime with the Air Force we do a static display where we've got a rig on display and our uh, racing Can-Am and a racing Skidoo and uh, last year we drove the truck all the way down to Arizona for an Amsoil distrib distributor convention and it's all great interaction and it's like you have to work every single day and appreciate what you've got because every day you try to get something 20 people are trying to steal from you I bet. i'm not gonna let that happen you know i saw it from day one and i still see it you know if you can do it for ten dollars someone else found the lake can do it for nine and it's like bullshit you know yeah. they know they know the real deal i mean there's a reason we've been doing this for 23 years i don't mind you know toot my own horn god dang it, i work hard for this and uh you know i've got my hand on the pulse and i know what's going on with this race team all the time and you know the, the one thing i've learned is never say no I'll always say okay let me figure out a way to work it out and it, it, it's paid back dividends you know the beaver pelts and beads theory that i have works great i don't mind doing something extra for any of them and uh, you know for example air force i mean we get to fly in an f-16 i mean that's a pretty good trade-off for going to an air show in my opinion you know um you know and well any of them four trucks in milwaukee it's it's a partnership that's beyond a contract for sure you need contracts nowadays because of legal reasons and insurance but it goes into a relationship and you know it's getting more challenging to get sponsors than easier and the whole digital marketing which i'm sure you're experiencing too took a lot of dollars and just brought it into the internet system rather than you know actual at track activities so right it's tough and uh like i say i say thank you every day for what i have and i've been very fortunate you know, to have the long-term relationships that i've had with everybody and but part two of it comes with a lot of hard work and over delivering all the time so i've, I've got to tell the one personal story that i somewhat referenced earlier so um i'm a good friend of mine chris riley who does the super slut online uh, webcast which i'm a huge fan of um a couple of years ago, I, I followed him up to the NHRA Nationals for the big asphalt shootout that they do up there. Um, so it's it's the national NHRA races, but they run snowmobiles on asphalt up there, and it's a huge deal. Um, and so I get up there, I'm kind of getting the lay of the land, and all of a sudden I see Steve Big Semi there, and I'm like, well, he doesn't have a drag racer. Well, you know, so I end up, you know, of course, going in there and talking to everybody, and you know, Steve's out serving as a trailer for one of the drag racers or whatever. Well, it wasn't until I got home and watched the tape of that race when the cameras were shooting, like when the big cars, when the NHRA, you know, top fuel guys were on the line and the cameras were shooting straight down the line. And the background is this Amsoil billboard, which was your semi. And of course, these are the Lucas Oil Nationals, which are, you know, one of Amsoil's main competitors. It was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. I, you know, how you plan stuff out like that, I don't know, but, but God bless you for, for doing fun stuff like that. That was, that was cool. Well, I'll tell you, to make part two of that story that was really interesting, when we pulled up, the staging people are like, there ain't no way in hell you can park where we can see you. So they tucked me in behind another trailer. We had um, Jason Hull had one of his sleds that we were basically pitting out of our trailer uh, with. And so they tucked us in behind another guy, two back from the starting line. So we were shielded because they had, um, you know, Lucas, we had Amsoil, they had... Um, amp energy drink in the back then we I think we had Rockstar and so yeah. everything they had we didn't have so they shielded us well after qualifying the trailer that was parked next to us never made it <laughs> decided to go home so they pulled out Friday night and I'm like jackpot and okay. so we were right in the limelight every time that the starts got taken down at Brainerd you know we were the backdrop so I mean that was some good fortune 
Yes, it was. It was, it was like I said, that was pretty dang cool. Um, so you have had a lot of really interesting racers come through your, your stable over the years, whether you're talking, you know, going back to, to Chris Vincent or DJ Ekstrom or Justin Tate or, you know, coming forward to Robbie Malinowski or Lincoln Lemieux or, or Tim Tremblay. What are some of the memories of the, of the people that you've worked with and specifically the racers that some fans may know who, you know, what, what, what pops into the head when I, or into your head when I mentioned some of those guys? Well, let's take Chris Vincent, for example, my very first racer. Him and Tim Matt, he raced first year for me. And for sure, Chris was kind of a unique individual. Yes, he was. But I tell you what, when he put on that helmet, he was going to go win every single race he went out there or die trying. And, and to see that desire, that was pretty damn cool. You know, you go through the years, and um, as we transition, like I said, not just about racing, fast forward to Lincoln and Hunter, they're great about, you know, going to the school visits, interacting with, uh, a grade school class that comes over here for winning a, a reading contest, uh, they see that side of it. They see the social media side of it. Um, right. The thing that I don't like for memories is how many of my guys have gotten hurt over the years, which yeah. along with other racers get hurt. It's like, it, it, it's like watching a championship go down the drain because a broken leg or a separated shoulder. You know, that's not a fun memory, but you become calloused after doing this for a while and you understand that it's going to happen to everybody sooner or later and you pray it doesn't happen to you this year and, and you work your way through it and you make plans, you know, contingency plans for it. But very, very fortunate that um, I get to, um, sorry about that. Um, no problem. I get to, you know, have the best racers in the world. I mean, Tim, yeah. one of my last drivers, he was a great guy too and uh, strong and had that same desire to win and, you know, now we have a very cohesive team and, and I want to keep my drivers that I have for a long time because we truly have the gel going. The other thing that, that you know, when, when we as fans, um, you know, see the sleds go around the track and you see different uh, racers scrub off of each other, different, you know, rival teams are kind of, uh, you know, well, this team winner, that team, and, you know, this driver's a rival of that driver. I think what a lot of people tend to forget in sports like this is that all of you all are kind of a, a traveling band of thieves. I mean, you all know each other. You've all known each other forever. The, the race team owners work very closely with the race circuit. The racers, when they're not on the track or oftentimes hanging out, it's, it really is almost kind of a, of a big traveling family, isn't it? It truly is. You know, the gloves come off when everybody goes on the track, and for sure, there's times I'd like to kill another racer after <laughs> an event got done or one of our guys get taken out or whatever. But the following day, if that racer came over and said, I need a ski, can you help me? We would gladly give him one. And, and that's the cool thing about our sport. And I see that in the summer racing as well. So we're very fortunate that we truly have that. You know, if somebody's broke down along the road on the way to a race, somebody will stop and help them. I mean, there, there's that camaraderie that is a huge part of the fun of this whole racing. You know, it's not just the event itself of doing the racing. It's leading up to it, you know, seeing everybody at the restaurant the night before, eating as, you know, teams, everybody's got their own little hood going. So that part of it's really cool. And you look at somebody like myself, um, Scott Judnick, Warren, it's all them guys have been around for a long time. So Absolutely. we have a lot of history, you know, and we've got a real good stable base of, of quality teams out there. And each year, a couple more filter in. And, you know, we're very fortunate about our sport. Everybody says the sky is falling in our sport, but I call bullshit. It's yeah. like, I counted there's 26 race semis at our race at Canterbury. There's not that many to Supercross. Yeah. You, know, yeah like, right. you can say we you want. We've got a strong sport right now. And, you know, we've got a very strong um, series with the ISOC. They do a great job of putting events on. And if you don't believe them, just go to another race that they're not involved with. And you can learn pretty fast. <laughs> so it's always a good time. You know, right now, is it a little bit scary with the Corona deal? I don't know. I think everything's going to work out. Yeah. The, uh, the, the so this this let's let's focus on this year for a second. So this year the season got cut short. You had a driver who uh, going into uh, the last few weekends was running uh, just a couple points behind in the uh, pro light class. Lincoln was coming around and having a decent season. What's that like to pour your heart and soul into something like this? And you got your sponsors that you're trying to get exposure for and stuff, and all of a sudden. Well, I suppose like the rest of us in society, the rug gets pulled out from under you. How, how, how did you deal with that this year? Well, I had a little pity party. I'm not going to lie on that one. We, um, the tough part about that was at New York, uh, we were leading the race with Hunter and he got taken out. 
um, by the guy that ended up winning the championship and they put him in last place and they took away his points. And at that point we were two points ahead and then they decided to reinstate his, his points, you know, as of last place, which I guess is a fair thing to do. So it was four points different. We're going to New York, excuse me, going to, to Michigan and they had each other in the first seat. And I'm like, we're going to smoke them. <laughs> and we're out warming up the Stoneville's getting ready for practice. And all of a sudden I saw guys are meeting and they go, yep, the governor just called, shut it down. I'm like, yeah. Are you kidding me? I'm like, yeah. can't you go to voicemail or something for a couple hours? <laughs> you know, so we could have got a little bit of racing in that day. And it was truly unfortunate because it looked like it was going to be a great race facility. The track looked great. It looked like people were starting to filter in and it, it, it just, it's a tough deal. And, you know, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes with the Corona stuff and yeah. didn't have any choice. So all we could do is like, you know, pack up and, and head back and hope that we were going to Geneva. And I tell you what, we got back Friday, Saturday night. And by the time Sunday came around, you know, the whole wheels were falling off everything with the whole Corona deal. And at that point, it's pretty obvious we weren't going to Lake Geneva, which was a bummer because Hunter won all three days down there last year. So yeah. it was a pretty good idea. He was going to, you know, do good down there. But, um, it, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword. And we had a couple other mistakes. We, um, we were at Deadwood. He had a 19-second lead in the final. And he was passing a lap guy missed the missed the yellow flag just pure innocence and yeah. they moved us back four spots personally i wish they could have just docked us 10 seconds or whatever because we still won the race but it's just you know what we lost 10 points there um you got in a couple crashes at iowa that just really set us back and it's just like those little mistakes and i knew at the beginning of the year that's what was going to be the you know the make or break and because we won Every single heat with Hunter in the first five races, we never lost the heat. Right. You know, so it's like, we got the train rolling. And Lincoln, he won at Canterbury the same night Hunter won. And he ended up in third place overall. So you can't hang your head too much when your guys finish second and third in the top best racers in the world. I mean, that's something to be pretty proud of, especially, you know, who we're taking on. And it's like, had the season played out, I think we would have won at least one championship and finished in the top three in the other, but easy to say what if. So you yeah. just, that's the cool thing about being a racer, a race team owner. You're the eternal optimist. There's always tomorrow. With Hunter Patnoat in particular, I mean, you know, you and I discussed this track site actually at, at Eagle River this year, uh, which by the way, kudos to your race team too for showing up at, at events like Eagle River or the Grand Prix de Valcour that are maybe outside of the, the ISOC circuit, but still important events. That it's important to showcase that. But uh, back to the point, you know, at, at mid season, some people were saying that it was unfair that your driver was even in pro light because he was so dominant. I mean, you guys were just kicking butt at that point. And then to, to lose the, uh, the points championship by that much, that had to, uh, had to, had to twist the knife a little bit. But, uh, but I'm sure you guys will be back at it. Yeah. And, and that bugs me a little bit that people say it's unfair. I was only a second year in uh, pro light. And it's not fair that he gets punished for working harder than everybody else, putting in the extra effort. You know, it wasn't like he was a 10 year veteran of pro light. It was the yeah. second full year of pro light. So it's like, and part two of the equation is Skidoo had six top pro racers. There wasn't a spot for him in pro. You know, it's like, we're just following the rules. And, and in the worst way I wanted to do an April fool's joke this year, where saying, yeah, we got special permission from ISOC. Hunter's going to be running pro light for one more year. We're pretty excited <laughs> and watch, you know, the internet come unglued at that point of people just going, wow, you know, yep. but I thought, ah, I better not. There's going to be a suicide somewhere. So, so that transitions to the obvious question. So for next year, what do you got going? Who's racing well, what? Yeah, for sure. Hunter and, and Lincoln will both run pro for us. Okay. Um, you know, we have a, a, a sport like I need to it in the Valley that races for us under our umbrella as well. He got hurt this year, so he didn't get to go to any races, but you know, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate that Hunter and Lincoln, you know, are great teammates. They train together, they work together, they feed off each other. Um, there, there's such value in that. You know, we, we don't want, not that I've had any high maintenance drivers in the past, but it's like having that energy in the team that everybody's going for that common goal that's worth horsepower right there. Yeah. So, so yeah. Oh, go sorry, ahead. go ahead. 
So uh, our plan is, you know, for sure we're on the full ISOC series. We'd love to go back to Eagle River. We'd love to go up to uh, Valcourt, um, do as much racing as we can because it's like, it's a short season. Everybody says it's a grind. And I'm like, it's not. It's only 10 or 12 races. It's not that big of a deal. Um, and that's what we're doing is racing. And I, I've learned, and my drivers also have learned that if you can stay racing without taking a three or four week, you know, break in the middle of the season because of Christmas or whatever, it, it just keeps everything rolling. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. So we're probably going longer than we should have. So I'll, I'll throw one last wrap up question. What? At. I know, I know. You and I could probably talk forever. We could be like do a 12 part episode of this thing. So we could, um, and I could tell you some good stories. Well, that's what I'm here for. So that actually leads into my final question. So you, again, you have been at this uh, team ownership thing, running, sharing speed sports for what, 23 years or whatever it's been. Um, you've won X Games championships. You've had some really emotional races where, you know, where injured racers come back and get their first victory back. The, you know, first victories of people's careers have happened to you. If you had to mention three highlights from – for the really stick with you things that uh, will you'll forever cherish as, as the owner of sharing speed sports what is it well one of them that comes to mind right away is uh spirit Mo in 2012 we took first second and third in pro open uh only team to ever ever do that and um rob malinowski took first uh tim trembley took second and darren meese took third and have all three guys on a podium yeah that was like a little bit of rubbing everybody's face moment there i'm not gonna lie you know for sure winning the x games was fantastic um winning the championship last year and actually both guys running for the championship last year those are all high points anytime you can win a race it's like it just provides validation for what you've done in it and it's frustrating when you know you get taken out from a race or something and, and you understand that's part of racing but it's like it still sucks because you put that effort into or somebody else gets taken out from another team i, I feel their pain as well and yeah, you know the last couple of years. I mean, we really worked hard with Skidoo to to build up to what they have now, and you know they have the premier sled out there. And the biggest thing, I'm not boring you, am I? No, not at all. Okay. And the biggest thing that you know has changed in the sport is the technology. Yeah. You, you know the fuel injection, the carburetors are gone. Everything's done with a laptop now. I mean, our hands never smell like gas anymore, and <laughs> you know everything runs so crisp, and it, it's just that level when we first got that three years ago you know there was concerns like is this going to live on the track and knock on wood in three years man we've had very minimal failures and it's really truly been a technology great idea so what's the best part of being a team owner and what's the most challenging part oh that's a good question you know the best part of being a team owner is just validation in that you worked really hard for a goal and you, you've achieved it and we base our team on integrity and 99.9 percent .9 of the people that i talk to understand that and and they respect me for that and you know that stuff i learned in kindergarten about being nice to people they'll be nice to you if not you don't want them as a friend you make a mess pick it up that kind of stuff you know that's that's rewarding that i can hold my head high anywhere i want and that knowing that we want every single race and championship that we won by never cheating. We did it fair and square by hard work. Downside, when drivers get hurt, driving in a snowstorm sucks. These <laughs> big trucks, you know, it's like, I don't want to be the fastest truck driver out there. I want to be the safest truck driver out there and not have stories to tell at the end of the year. And that's more draining than being at the races. You know, there's times I wish I could wave a magic wand and there was no snow between here and New York on the highways, but part of the deal. Um, you know, for sure, there's some stuff, you know, making snow is not the most fun, but I have a great crew with that. Um, yeah. the, the tough part with all of my business is, you know, between the, the racing and the firefighting, is it's like mother nature. She's either my friend or my enemy. And, yeah. you know, it seems like it averages out over 10 years, but, man, you have to take advantage of every window you have now. Perfect. All right. Well, with that, let's give one quick plug to your sponsors that, uh, and all the people that support you. Well, for sure, you know, I'm very fortunate to have somebody like Anvil as our primary sponsor. We just re-signed another two years. And, and maybe one thing I want to say is that, you know, people that are involved with racing or involved with some wheels, you guys need to patronize the people that support the sport, whether they're buying ads in magazines, whether they're um, 
you know, promoting race teams or promoting series and not just our sponsors, all the people that sponsor, you know, the trucks that are not our sponsors that sponsor the series. I mean, like yeah. if you guys, you know, patronize them, they're going to continue to do it. But if you guys look for deals on the internet, you know, <laughs> to save $5, that's all going to go away and there's not going to be any racing anymore. So, you know, and they're all great products out there, not just our sponsor products, but everybody's out there, you know, they're promoting great products. And, um, yep. you know, that, if I could bring out one message, I mean, that, that's so key nowadays. And, you know, besides AMZO, we've got the U S air force, we've got climb clothing, we've got Milwaukee tools Ford trucks, uh, BRP skidoo, we have Woody's, we have action graphics, Fox shocks, CNA pro skis, rocks, speed effect, Goodwin performance. You, you know, the list goes on and on what we have, and we're very fortunate and that we have all those because it's expensive to run a team. It's very expensive. I mean, we'll spend a weekend in a hotel with your wife and multiply that times 10. 